Okay, so with those preliminaries out of the way, I shall uh, begin with today's session. And really, it's it's. So I want to just show this picture here because really this it represents kind of the um, the sort of first inklings of of, math, of noise in mathematical systems. So so these are little pollen grains that are resting on the surface of of some water, and if you if you look at them or you image them, uh, you can see that you can. Uh, can't stop that thing. You can see these little random motions, these random uh, little things. And this was what was originally described as a Brownian motion. So this kind of random, undirected um, perturbations that move these little grains around. And, and really a lot of the mathematical descriptions build off this notion, uh, build off this notion of, of Brownian motion. So there are whole branches of mathematics to, to deal with this. Um, we're going to use it in the context of, of dynamical systems to um, to link with what we've been doing before, but of course you can you can think of it at, at a much more abstract level than that. Um, and really, this is all due, due to something called probability theory. So some of you may remember this from from school. It's all to do with the with chance events, so the probability of certain things happening. Uh, and and really, probability theory, although it's pure mathematics, really forms the basis for statistics. And I imagine that pro probably everybody in in this group at some point has done some statistics. And some, there are some very sophisticated approaches now to removing noise from data and simulating with noise. Uh, and so actually, you know, there is an awful lot out there if you really want to look for it, for how to incorporate this naturally into your descriptions. But actually, um, what I really want to sort of talk through today is how really simple algorithms can actually do most of the heavy lifting for us. A lot of the sophisticated approaches are really to do with, with uh, speeding things up and reducing computational load than they are to do with anything specifically related to the models. And of course, uh, this is helped uh, ever more by the fact that computers are getting more and more powerful. They're getting bigger and bigger. Um, we now have national computing resources. So actually, even if you do a really, really simple thing with it in a simple model, you can, you can do pretty big uh, dynamical systems. OK, so today I want to give you a little introduction to these uh, what I call stochastic processes, so noisy processes. And I'm going to do this in the context of, of channel dynamics and then a return to the Brusselator model that we talked about right at the beginning, if you remember back three weeks ago. Um, so we're going to have a look at the dynamics uh, comparing what happens in the what I call deterministic models. So this is the model with no noise and the model with some uh, stochastic element. And we're going to do this using MATLAB. Um, I hope this will work. Uh, we're not going to use the breakout rooms today. So use the chat, please, if you have a question or alternatively, um, if you just want to unmute yourself and just, I don't know, tell me to put the brakes on uh, and, and tell me uh, what's going on, then please do that. I will check in uh, when we're doing the MATLAB after I've finished doing my bits, uh, just to see how you guys are getting on with it. So this is our, my, my first example. And, and this is something that's very close to my heart uh, because it's about uh, ion channel dynamics. So uh, over here, we can see a channel. This is a, in a closed state. And this basically, this channel is going to switch between two conformations. Uh, the green state, uh, which paradoxically is the, uh, is the closed state, and a red state in which it's open. So you'll see this pore open in a minute when I play this movie. And when it's open, ions can flow through, and then this induces currents in the cell, and et cetera, et cetera. But the key point is that it, this channel jumps between two different states. And it does this in a probabilistic fashion. So although this can be guided by things, in general, these transitions are happening all of the time, they're chance events. In terms of the actual state of this channel, we can realize this mathematically as like uh, this, what we call double well potential. So the idea is that we have two wells, so this is called X minus and X plus, and these represent the, uh, open, the closed state here and the open state here. And this little particle is, is some variable that keeps track of whether the, the channel is open or closed. So at the moment, it's in, it's in this well here, so bounded by x naught and this, this side here, and x minus, which corresponds to the channel being closed. If it jumps over this little barrier, this little hill here, x naught, it'll jump into this other well, and this well corresponds to the channel being open. On, on this long graph here at the bottom, <clears throat> I'm going to plot the position of, of this little particle and then also indicate on it with green and red lines 
when it's open and closed. So if I play this, you can see it jumps around, then it jumps into the open state, jumps back into the closed state, and jumps back into the open state, and this process essentially repeats. And really what we do when we, when we think about um, you know, protein dynamics moving uh, between different states, we're really biasing the movement of this particle in one direction, right? So the events themselves are still probabilistic, but we, we can spend more time in the open state or the closed state, depending on how we perturb the system. The other thing I want to say is that in terms of the actual motion of this particle, you can see it's quite erratic. Um, so the noise here is, is reasonably high. So this noise is this, you know, these vertical uh, fluctuations around these points. But actually, in terms of what I'm interested in, I don't really much about the actual absolute position of the particle. I just care about which well it's in. So you can see broadly that it spends more time in the green well than it does in the red well. And all I really need to do is keep track of whether the state is green or red. If we think back to what Piotr was talking about last week and actually Krasi the week before, this system is an example of something that's bistable. So there are two stable configurations because you know if you imagine like a little marble, if you drop it here and there's there's no there's no noise, it will just sit in this well here. Conversely, if I drop it, it will go into this well here and just stay there. It's only if you, you know, if you have a little a beaker and you shake it, that induces some noise that you can make transitions. But both of these states are stable. If you, if the particle here will just stay here for all time if there's no noise. And what we're doing is by injecting some noise into the system, we're now allowing transitions between these two stable states. And really the noise then is affecting how long we spend in each of these different states. So that's the link between uh, what Piotr was talking about yesterday and what we're doing today. But I really don't wanna go through all the rigmarole of really having to keep track of where this particle is at all times. So we're gonna rely on a little bit of, of mathematical theory here. Um, and it's not, um, it's not super important to know all of the details, but the key thing here is to note that what we're trying to do is trying to get a much simpler representation of how long we spend in each well. So if we assume that the, the particle spends most of its time near the bottom of the well, instead of keeping track of its position the whole time, we can think about this as, as like an energy landscape. So we can think about these potential barriers. So X naught here is the top of the hill. Remember, we have to get over the top of the hill before we can transition from one well to the other. So it makes sense to think about how high this particle has to climb. So it doesn't really matter whether we come from the X minus or the X plus, there's still a, there's still a potential barrier on either side. And there is a really nice bit of mathematics that says that under this configuration, assuming that we spend a lot of time near the bottom of these wells, we can write down the expected transition time out of each of these wells to be some function that looks like this. So there's some exponential dependence on the height of the potential barrier. This is scaled by something uh, that involves the temperature of the system. So here the temperature really is something that scales the noise. Um, this really comes from kind of physics ideas that if you increase the temperature in the system, you increase the noise because you're making thermal fluctuations play a much bigger role. And there's some parameter here, new plus or minus, this is what you fit to the actual data that you have. So the, the key thing here though, is that this number here, this tau plus minus tells you how long you're expecting to wait, or how long you're expecting to stay rather in each of these wells. So tau minus for the minus well, tau plus for the plus well. I hope everyone is sort of getting the intuition there. So instead of doing long simulations of particles, which are quite computationally intensive, we can instead just think about transitions between, between wells. And remember the wells correspond to states. So this is really the transitions between open and closed states. And of course, this then greatly simplifies the complexity of the problem because now we just need to keep track of whether the, the channel is open or closed and how long we have to wait for the next event. So just, um, these are some uh, essential assumptions that we make when we're dealing with this kind of system. And the primary thing for us is that we're assuming that the probability of, of a transition event is really only dependent on where we are now. Uh, and essentially that means that we forget our history. So it doesn't depend on what's happened in the past. We can, we can write down this model on the basis of current knowledge of the system. Uh, this is called the Markov property uh, and the systems that, that have this property are called Markovian. So if you hear people talking about Markovian systems, really they just mean history independent. So, or memoryless, I guess, is the other, other way we could think about this. So, for example, if you, if you roll a die 
the probability of you landing on any given number is the same for each roll. So if you have a fair die, it's just one sixth. So you're equally not likely to land on any of the numbers. Even if the die is not fair, it's still memoryless because each time you roll it, you're essentially resetting the system. Um, but there are good examples of, of non-Markovian systems. So, um, so the classic example here is, is things like blackjack. So if you play blackjack, the cards are dealt to the house and to the players. But the important thing is, is that the, card, the deck is not typically reshuffled after each hand. So that means that the probability of getting cards in the future is really dependent on what's come in the past. You know, you can't, you can't get the ace of spades in the future if it's already been dealt. Uh, and this is actually, you know, for those of you that are interested in those kind of things, this is the reason why, why people have been able to um, and actually turn blackjack into a profitable game for them. Uh, so there's been a number of books and films about this, this kind of card counting that goes on in blackjack. But we're not going to assume that. We're going to assume that our systems don't depend on the history. They only depend on where they are now. So let's think then about the, the simple, simplified dynamic. So now I've replaced my, my potential well with just a really simple schematic. So you may recall that these are the same kinds of schematic that I used to talk about the Brusselator model right back in week one. So now we have a, a state where the channel is closed, I'm going to call C, and a state where the channel is open, I'm going to call O. And there's a forward transition probability called alpha and a backward transition probability called beta. So alpha is the probability per unit time of the channel transitioning between closed and open, and beta is the, uh, the inverse of that. And we can relate these to the dwell times. So remember tau minus was the expected dwell time in the closed state, tau plus was the expected dwell time in the open state, and the, probability, the probabilities of transitioning per unit time then are just the reciprocals of those. Okay, and this kind of makes sense, right? So um, if alpha is really, really big, then your expected dwell time in the closed state should be really, really small and, and vice versa. And we simulate this, the opening and closing of these channels, the sort of simplest way of doing it um, is something called the Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Uh, and, and really all we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna chunk along in, in some small time windows and we're just gonna ask ourselves, given that the channel is in one state, what's the probability of it transitioning to the other? And then simulate that process as if we were tossing a coin in this example. And so the, the, the variable now in our system, remember the variables before were things like concentrations or positions. Uh, our variable now is, is essentially a true or false variable. So, um, and well, the true or false really are, are mapped directly onto the channel being closed and open. And I'm gonna take true to be open and false to be uh, closed. And in programming languages, uh, true and false actually equate to integer values, so true, uh, maps to one and false maps to zero. Uh, this is really just, this is a, a, a generically true statement for programming languages, not just MATLAB, but it's, it's something that we can, we can use to simplify some of the, the actual coding. So how does the Monte Carlo method work? So if the channel is in the closed state, remember that it has this, this forward uh, transition probability is alpha. So if we look at that over some time window delta t, then the probability of actually making a jump is then alpha just times that time. So this kind of makes sense, right? The longer you wait, the, the higher the probability that you'll actually transition over that time window. And you know, similarly, if the channel is open, uh, remember that the, channel, the probability of the channel closing is beta. So again, right, if we, if we wait a time delta t, the probability that the, the channel closes over that time window is beta times the, the duration of the time window. And what we do then is we, we, just, we just chunk along in windows of length delta t. Um, we, we look at whether the channel is open or closed, and then we, uh, we, then we calculate the probability that over that window an event actually occurs, and then we just toss a coin and see if it happens. Uh, and tossing a coin in MATLAB involves doing something like this. So we, we can draw a random number over this interval 0, 1. So it's just any, any number between 0 and 1. And if this number is smaller than the probability of a transition event occurring, then that event occurs. So if the channel is closed and our randomly sampled number is less than this probability alpha delta t, then we say that the channel opens. Okay, and again, so you can see that if alpha delta t is really, really big, then the probability of a transition occurring is really, really high. Um, and conversely, if, if alpha delta t is really, really small, then the, the probability of a channel opening is, is pretty small. 
So this is what our MATLAB code is going to try and emulate. Okay, it's going to be all of these, I call these things like coin tosses, because basically there's only two events that can occur. Either you stay in the channel uh, state or you transition to the other state. Okay, so now I'm going to go into MATLAB and I hope that everyone else uh, has, well, you should all have MATLAB um, on your computer. So if you can fire that up, uh, I'm going to start some new code here. Okay, so um, we're going to start a fresh script in MATLAB. So open up a new file. Um, so you can just click on the little plus icon up here. And we'll start with a fresh, a fresh bit of code ready to be populated. And I'm going to go through uh, how you would set up this Markov chain Monte Carlo for this system and plot some results. So uh, if you have the primer with you, um, that's also useful, but it, it doesn't really matter for today. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define some parameters in the system because obviously we need to set these to be some value. So I'm just going to write down parameters here. So the little uh, percentage sign here just means that this is a comment. So MATLAB is not going to read this. This is just for me. So I know how to orientate myself around my own code. And then we have these two values, tau minus and tau plus, which if you remember are the expected dwell times. And we can get these directly from the uh, potential wells. So I'm going to say tau m is one, and I end this with a semicolon because otherwise MATLAB will spit every single value back at the screen at me. So, and then I'm going to write tau plus equals 0.4. So this is expected dwell time in the down state or the closed state, expected dwell time in the up state. For completeness, I'm going to I'm going to write these in terms of the transition probabilities. So remember, these were called alpha and beta, and this was just one over tau m and beta is 1 over tau p. Uh, the, the m and the, the p here just stand for minus and plus, because I can't actually put a minus sign and a plus sign here. So I, I use the convention that m stands for minus and p stands for plus. Uh, OK, so, so that's that. And then, and then we need some variable to keep track of whether the channel is open or closed. I'm going to call this state flag. So state underscore flag. And we're going to assume that my channel starts in the closed state. So 0 closed, one, open. Again, this is just, these are just notes for myself. So zero corresponds to the channel being closed, one, open. And it's just going to switch between these two variables. So the next thing is for me to set some time parameters for the system. So remember we said before we were going to chunk along in windows of length delta t. So here I'm just going to abbreviate that to dt. Um, you, you, you ideally want to set this dt parameter to be reasonably small because you don't want to, you really want to be describing a kind of system where at most one event occurs over this, this DT. Um, so small values are usually better. So I'm going to put mine to be 0 0.01. Time here is kind of arbitrary because uh, I haven't told you what the time scale is, but this number should be quite small. Then I need to decide how long I'm going to actually simulate for. Uh, again, this is something that you can, you can set depending on what kind of dynamics you see. Uh, I'm going to set simulation length to be 1,000 here. You know, you can play around with numbers uh, once you've observed the system behavior. OK, and then, and then what I'm going to do is work out how many steps that that involves, right? So the number of steps I need to take is this number divided by this number. So I'm going to call a new variable no underscore steps equals simulation, oops, simulation length divided by dt. And you can kind of, hopefully you can see what's going to happen here is I'm going to loop over the number of steps. And each time I'm going to, I'm going to play this game of figuring out whether a transition event occurred and then toggle the state flag between zero and one, depending on what's happened. So that's, that's all of the parameterization of the system. Then I need to um, set up some initial arrays to search these values. So hopefully if you read in the primer, really the best way to do programming is to pre-allocate arrays wherever possible. Here is a good example of when we know how big the system uh, will be. So again, another comment for output arrays. So I'm going to keep two things, a T array and a state array. So T array is just the set of times. Uh, and it's the state array is the state of the, the uh, channel each time. Uh, here, I'm going to, well, it doesn't really matter exactly how you do this, but so I'm going to write down my my T array like this. So what this will do is this will create an array with 
um, which just keeps track of the time as I chunk along. So it runs, this generates an array that just goes from zero all the way up to this number of steps minus one and it multiplies it by my time step. So this is just set time points. My state array, I don't know what values they're gonna be yet. Um, usually when you don't know what the value of something is gonna be, you set it all to zero. Um, so there's a MATLAB function zeros, which does that. And how many zeros do I need? Well, I need no steps of them. And then I have to include this one here as well. So what this will do is it will create an array where it's got one dimension that has uh, a place for me to put all of my state array values, uh, but it's only one dimensional. Okay, so if I put another value, a different value in here, it's like two, it will actually create a, a, a 2D array rather than a 1D array, but we only need 1D. So now we've got parameters established, we've got output established. The next thing to do is to, uh, oh, please let me know, by the way, if, if everyone is keeping up or if I'm going too slowly or, or what. Um, I guess there's little reaction buttons for that. So the next thing to do is to initialize the system. So, uh, let's spell initialize. So system. far, no complaints about the base. Great. Um, so T will obviously start at zero. Um, actually, I don't really need this because I'm storing my values in T array here, but we'll use this a bit later today. Um, and I'm going to set the value, the first value of my state array. So this is this indexing here is corresponding to the first element of this guy here. I'm going to set it to be the value set up here, so my state flag. So all I'm doing is storing this initial value. Okay, so that's, that's the system set up. So what we need to do now is to actually do the sort of heavy lifting, to do this loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop over a number of steps from one up to, well, actually from two, because I've already got the first step defined, from two up to this variable here, number of steps. So we do that by creating a MATLAB for loop. So for, I'm going to say step no. So this thing here is my, is my loop counter. So this thing is going to, is going to go up uh, by a value of one from two. And then I use a colon to go to no steps. So step, step number is going to start at two at the first time I go into this loop, then go three, four, five, six, seven, and it will stop when I get to here. Okay, so to generate a, a random number from zero to one in MATLAB, it's really, really easy. So I'm going to call my random number u, and I just type in rand. And this will generate one, one random number between zero and one. And every time I call it, it should be something different. So this is the way that, that MATLAB and, and in, in general, more other, other programming languages handle random number generation. So the next thing to do then is to query whether an event has actually occurred. And there are two possibilities here for events to occur. One is that my channel is in the closed state and it opens. The other one is if it's in the open state and it closes. So let's, let's code up both of those possibilities. So, and I'm going to use brackets here to separate my conditions. You don't actually need to do this in MATLAB, but I would strongly encourage that you do when you're doing conditional statements because it really helps you parcel up um, when events are occurring or not. So for my, for my channel to transition from the closed state, it first needs to be in the closed state. So if state flag equals zero, so this double equals here is how MATLAB compares two values. So this is just saying this will evaluate to true if the state flag is zero. And remember, my channel is only going to transition if this value u is smaller than alpha times delta t. So we can use an and, so two ampersands together are what we're going to use to do our and statement. And then we have u is less than alpha times dt. So only if this channel is closed and u is less than this probability of transitioning, is the state flag going to change? And of course, we know that the only way place for it to go is to go to the open state, so we can change state flag to be 1. So that means then the channel is open. OK, so the, the, the other thing that can happen is that the channel can close if it's open. So we emulate this line here, and we use the else if statement 
So else if will be evaluated if this is not true. And then we can go state flag equals one. So that corresponds to the channel being open. And u is less than beta times dt. So this is the, remember, this is the rate of closing, the probability of closing. And if that happens, then of course the state flag now is gonna go to zero. So those are the only two things that can happen. An open channel can close and a closed channel can open. Um, and if you want to convince yourself that this process here captures those dynamics, you can, you can see how if the state flag is closed, uh, sorry, if this channel is closed, but U is, is greater than this number, then it won't open. And conversely, if it's open and U is greater than this number, then it won't close. So you can check that if you like. Then we need to end this block code here. So MATLAB, we do that by typing end. So that's the if statement now done. And the next thing we need to do in this loop, or the final thing we need to do in this loop, is to just add the state flag at the current time to our state array so that it's stored for us to look at later. And what we do that is by just going state array, then we include our loop counter here, which is step no. So this will point to the step no element of this. And we just set it equal to the state flag like that. Okay, uh, and then we just end the main loop again by typing end. And let's save it as some system. Uh, what should I call it? Uh, I'll call it workshop one of workshop four, example one. Okay, we have to save it before MATLAB lets us run it. And uh, let me just clear off all my other variables. So now if I hit the green arrow, uh, on the right hand side now, I get some values in my state array, my state. Uh, and my T array. So you can query this just by typing. This is a little command window. If we type in the command window, we should see that I've got a, a vector here, an array here that just is filled with zeros and ones. Okay, um, so I'm gonna assume that everyone else has, has got this array uh, populated with some numbers. Uh, but of course, you know, we really wanna have a look at something. We wanna look at a plot. So we can plot this really, really simply by being in. So plots is the plot command. And what I want to do is I want to plot the state array against the T array. So in MATLAB, uh, whatever you put in the first bit here will be along the x-axis. This will be along the y-axis. Uh, as Piotr showed last week, uh, there are some properties of lines that you can vary. I like reasonably thick lines because I can see them better. Uh, and actually for screen sharing, this is probably useful. So I'm gonna put my line width up to four here. Uh, it's really important to label our axes as we all tell uh, when we work. So, labels, so the X label and Y label command put labels on the X label and the Y label, uh, on the y, uh, X axis and Y axis. Uh, and that should now pretty much be good enough to actually plot. So if I click this, uh, now you can see I've got what looks like a blue rectangle. Uh, and this is because the, the, part, the state of the channel is, uh, is jumping around a lot. I'm just gonna change the font size on my plot so you can see it. Um, this is, all this is doing is just changing the, the, these guys here. And really what this is, ha what this is happening because the, the channel is jumping quite a lot in terms of its state. So uh, we can see this just by focusing on a little bit of it. So there's a little uh, magnifying glass here that allows me to just zoom in on a portion of it. So if I do that and I just focus on this last bit here, we can see now really the transitions between these different states. So that's how we visualize what's going on. We can also set explicitly X limits and Y limits in the command window. And if you look at the file that I sent you earlier today, that actually explicitly does that. So now the point is that we, we can see the transitions between the closed and the open state. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Um, okay, so, so that's how we, can, how we can do a really simple Monte Carlo method. In actual fact, we can speed things up uh, significantly if we, instead of just chunking along in, in, in epochs of time delta t, by actually using our estimation of our transition time. And the idea is that we only consider events when they actually occur. 
So if we have a, in a if we're in the closed state, then the probability of the uh, channel opening, we know that the, the dwell time is given by uh, tau minus. So the probability, if we wait some time t or tau is open, that an event actually occurs is given by this probability distribution here. And again, so there's some nice mathematical theory that tells us why this should be the case. But the key thing is that actually, if we just take that random number u that we had earlier, then the actual time to the next event can just be expressed like this. So it's the minus the natural logarithm of that random number times our expected dwell time. Okay, and then conversely, if we're, in the, if we're already in the, the open state, then we can work out the time to closing um, by using tau plus instead of tau minus. Because remember, this is our dwell time in the open state. Okay, so uh, I sent another piece of code to do this, uh, which but I guess will go through the same kinds of stuff. So if we open up a new document here, uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be recycled anyway from our previous code because we're solving the same system. Uh, in general, people tell you that you probably shouldn't copy and paste code, um, but in practice, everybody does. So um, I don't think there's any great issue with doing that. So I'm going to copy the parameters and the state flag uh, and all of this stuff from here into my new file. You don't need from beta now. Okay, but I will need my state flag. I won't need my DT because remember now we're not chunking along in windows of length DT. And I also won't need my number of steps because I actually don't know how many steps I'm going to take. I'm now just going to simulate the system when I know an event occurs. Okay, um, we should also, formally, we should do some pre-allocation here. I'm not going to do so because um, just, for, just for time in the session, if you actually look through the channel uh, Gillespie file I sent you, this actually goes through how you should formally pre-allocate memory. Uh, for this kind of simple system that we're doing here, the penalty we pay by not pre-allocating is, is not that big. So I'm just gonna do it like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a T array, which I'm now gonna, gonna be empty. Well, actually no, I should start from T equals zero. So I'll start an initial condition from T equals zero again. And I'm going to have my T array just with essentially the value zero and my state array with my state flag here. So before I had a loop counter to keep track of where I was in the system, in this example, I'm not going to have that. And so I need to keep a, an index variable to tell me where I am, to tell me where, uh, actually, no, I don't need my index here. Sorry, ignore that. That's when I'm pre-allocating. So instead of using a for loop now, we're going to use a while loop because what's going to happen is I'm going to simulate when events occur and then I'm going to update my time. So it's like I'm waiting for an event to occur, then I have a bit of time, uh, and then I will store the values of those times. And then I'm going to end the simulation when my time exceeds the simulation length that I really want. So this can be done using something called a while loop. So I'm going to use while t is less than simulation length. So this will continue to run whatever I put in this block code until t is bigger than simulation length. Okay, so but what that will mean is I will go slightly further than I really want to, but it doesn't really matter. As before, I generate a random number. So just using that. And again, now I need to consider the two events. So my channel can open if it's closed or close if it's open. So now I say if my state flag is zero. So if my state flag is, if my channel is closed, then I have time to transition, which is the time of my next event. And then this is going to be minus log. So in MATLAB, well, in four, four mathematicians, when we talk about logs, we always talk about natural logarithms. Um, I know that that is not quite true in the sciences where typically it's log base 10, but in mathematics, this is always the natural logarithm. So minus the log of u, which is our random number, times tau minus, which is our expected dwell time in the closed state. So this will tell me how much I need to update T by. Okay, and then, so here, 
And then if I'm, if I'm closed, I only can go to open. So I should set my state flag uh, to be uh, open. So the state flag is one. Okay, of course, if my state flag, if my channel is open, so if my state flag is one, then I need to replace the tau minus in here with a tau plus. So like that. And then I update my state flag to be zero corresponding to the closed state. And then I end my block of code. And now the key thing here is that remember, we're only simulating events when they actually occur. Okay, so that I, kn I know that if I'm in the closed state, I have to open. So there is no more conditional statement I need to put on here. And conversely, if I'm in the open state, I have to close because this is what this uh, is, is doing. This is called the exact stochastic simulation algorithm or the Gillespie algorithm for short, named after its creator. Okay, so, uh, so that's that. One thing I will do is just for plotting purposes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save the values of t and state flag to my array at two points. So before the transition and after the transition, this is just when I plot it to get these nice sharp vertical edges that we had in the last plot. So I do that just by doing T array here. So what, and then I give it another copy of T array and I extend it by some time T. So what this will do is that this will just append the value of T to the current array. This is not the most efficient way to do it computationally, um, but it's probably the easiest to go through today. And then similarly, I do the same thing for my state array. So I just append my state flag. And then I do the same after I've been through the loop. So this is before the update. This is after update. And then I can end my block of code after that. Okay, so that's that. And now I just need to plot it. So let's just copy the same bit of code from before. I might change my simulation to only be 100 time units now because um, 1000 was probably a bit too long. We have a question, Kyle. Do yep. you need to update T? Uh, yes, that is a great point. I need to update T. So I need to do that equals yeah thank you for that so the uh, i need to save this uh so i'll just call it workshop for example two very boring name uh and if i run this i now oh why have i why have i done that ah yes no you're right you're right or i can yeah or i can do it before so yeah, <clears throat> that's a good point. So if I do that, that should fix it. Okay, perfect. So now I've got nice crisp boundaries exactly as I did before. Okay, and, th and the point is really that this system now, because we're only simulating the system at the times when events occur, it means we're not doing all of these little chunks in delta t. So this is much more computationally efficient, especially if I pre-allocate my arrays properly. You can see here MATLAB's giving me a warning uh, that, uh, okay, Fiona, you have an issue that your vectors. Um, so that can happen if you haven't initialized things up here, or if you're not, you be adding to each array per loop, two values of T that should be the same, and then a state flag before the transition and after the transition. So you can see that MATLAB has given me a warning here that my state arrays is changing size, which it is doing because we're adding values to it. Um, and it says consider pre-allocating for speed. So uh, we can fix that. And in the code that I sent you earlier today, which is called channel Gillespie, it is fixed. Um, or, or conversely, you can just look at the notes that I'm going to send afterwards. Um, and then you can see how to pre-allocate to, to avoid this problem. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone has, has got and that's working. 
that's the code. And a nice little exercise that you can think about doing is, is now that you've analyzed or you've plotted these things, can you get, can you predict what proportion of the time the channel should spend in the closed or the open state? Uh, and does it match what you think it should be? So you can, you can do this in one of two ways. Um, so, oops. Uh, okay, so if we go into the, the I, I guess it's easiest to explain in the first example. So estimates, I'm gonna call it the dwell time. So dwell time is just how long I spend in each of the things, each of the, in each of the uh, states. So the ratio here is gonna be, so remember state array takes value one when I'm in the, the open state and zero when I'm in the down state or the, the closed state. So if I just add up the number of time steps that I'm in the open state and divide it by the number of time steps that I'm in the closed state, this value here will be the ratio of time that I spend open or the, the channel, I say not me. Uh, it's the ratio of the time the channel spends open uh, over the, the time it spends closed. Okay, so I'm gonna get uh, in. Uh, state array, sorry, not state flag. State array. So this is just the number of time steps I spend open versus the number of time steps I spend closed. And it comes up to about 0 0.4. And if I look at the ratio up here, I've got 0 0.4 divided by one. So that looks about right. So this gives us some confidence. Well, it gives us a lot of confidence that the MATLAB simulation is, is really doing what it's supposed to do. As a, a question left to the reader, or again, it's in the notes that I will send out after, after this session um, to see if you can work out what the equivalent would be looking at uh, this example where we only simulate the transition times. Uh, so yeah, this is, um, we're going back to the first example, the Monte Carlo example, where we chunk along in, in time steps of delta t, uh, just because it's really easy to, it's a really easy computation. The computation for the one where we just do the transition times is a little bit more involved. It's not that difficult, but it, but it is a little bit more involved. Okay, so uh, that's just one channel. One channel is, um, it's good, it's good to understand, but really when we, when we look at whole cells, um, there's lots of channels. So what happens when we, we vary all of the channels? I'm not gonna go through this in MATLAB now, but I've sent you the code to do this. I just wanna show you uh, mathematically what goes on. And really we're asking the question of um, what happens as the system, uh, okay, brilliant, fantastic. Um, so what, we're asking the question, what happens as we, as we let n get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? And when I talk about asymptotic values, I really mean n gets really, really big, like tens to infinity. And the question is, can you predict what the system might do from the values of the actual parameters? So here, the tau minus and the tau plus. Okay, so there's some code here to do this. Um, uh, and again, I've sent you this. And so what I would encourage you to do is to vary the parameter, the parameters n, uh, n channels. So this is the number of channels. Um, you can start off with something small like 10 and then, and then go up in, in orders of magnitude and you can see what the dynamics look like. Mathematically, um, we can go through a system that looks like this. So rather than thinking about the evolution of a single channel, we can just think about what the probability of a channel being open at some time is. So I'm gonna call this POT. So POT is the probability of a channel being open at a time T and PCT is the probability of the channel being closed. And then if we derive the mathematical equations for that, we can see that they just pick up these alpha and betas or these one over tau minus and tau pluses that we talked about earlier. Okay, so, um, so to get to the open state, we have to come from the closed state and we do that with probability alpha. If we're in the open state, we leave the open state with probability beta, so that's where this equation comes from. And we get exactly the same kind of equation for C. Um, of course, you may remember from probability theory that the probabilities of all the events have to sum to one. Our channel can only be closed or it can be open. 
So we can actually simplify this to just dealing with one of the two states and, and without loss of generality, I just pick the open one. So, so the probability of, of opening uh, is really governed by the number of channels that are not open. So the one, uh, ones that are closed and then they leave the open state with some probability beta. And really what that allows us to do then is to average, right? So rather than chunking along, uh, doing one channel at a time and seeing what happens to all of them, we can just think about the proportion of channels that are open at any one time. So F here is just the, the, the proportion of channels that are open. So number of open channels divided by total number of channels. And this obeys this equation, which really looks almost exactly like uh, the previous equation for uh, the probability of a channel being open. So this is a really classic thing to do in, in mathematical modeling that we're replacing a stochastic component with like an average component. And if you play around with the system and you actually plot lots of things on the same diagram, you should get something that looks like this. So here is a bunch of simulations that, uh, in which I've, I've changed the number of channels. So blue is 10 channels. You can see it's kind of, uh, so these transitions now, rather than having uh, just one channel, I've got 10. So this is just a fraction of channels that are open and I can see channel opening and closing events. As I increase to my N, so orange is hundred, you can see I have what looks like fewer fluctuations. And this is just because my N is going up. If I go up again, N equals a thousand, I get the yellow trace. And if I get the, uh, if I go up again to the purple trace, you can see actually now the fluctuations are really, really very, very small. And on, in black here, I plot what I call the average trace. So the average trace is uh, the solution in the same way that we computed, um, we integrated numerically solutions to, to the equations we looked at before. This is just the, uh, the solution to this equation. And as you can see, as I increase n, the, uh, the, the solutions approach this black curve. And so the final question for this, this model is, you know, can we predict what the value of this thing here should be uh, at large times, right? So you can see it, there's an initial rise from zero because remember all of our channels started in the off state. It looks like it, it plateaus, it flattens out. And the question is, what does it flatten out to? Um, I don't know if anyone in the chat has any guesses as to how you could work that out. Okay, well, I will, I will just, oh. Oh, there is. Yeah, there is a, very good. Okay, that is the perfect, yeah. So if we go uh, back, if I go back to this equation here, if I set f dot equals zero, then I get an equation, uh, a linear equation in f that I can solve, and then this will give me the, the, the actual answer. And you should be able to see that if I do that, then f, will be expressed in terms of alpha and beta, or in particular, a ratio of alpha and beta, or I, I've written it in terms of tau plus and tau minus. Uh, uh, tau, sorry, perhaps it's a good, good point to, to, re to relate it to steady state or equilibrium that we've discussed in previous sessions, because sure. that is the steady state, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just getting there. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, so if we do this, then, so I, I just, uh, rewritten it in terms of the tau plus and tau minus, because this is, I guess, the way I like to think about it. So if I take this ratio um, of, of the sum of, well, so tau minus over the sum of, of the taus, I get something like 0 0.2857, which if I look at my, my graph is about right. So I would really encourage you to go and have a look at changing the values of, of n. And so what Hannah has basically said here in the chat and what Krazy was just saying there is that Formally, what we're doing is we're, form we're finding the steady state of this equation. So this says that if we wait for a really, really long time, what does the system settle down to? Of course, the system is in a steady state if f dot equals zero. So, so the, the net behavior of the system is that channels don't open or close. Of course, individual channels could be opening or closing, but it's, it's in a balanced state. So this means that f is not changing over time, which means f dot equals zero. Um, and therefore, uh, we are in formally we're in a steady state and the key point is that not only as we increase n do we get the system behavior that approximates the average system but also that the steady states of the system are also captured and then as 
we will still get fluctuations around the steady state, but on average, the system does what we want it to do. Okay, so that's all I really want to say about channel opening and closing. Um, so I want to go back now in, in this sort of final uh, sort of 25 minutes to talk about, to go back to the brussellator. And really the key thing here in terms of the brussellator is that there's more than one different type of reaction. So before we had one channel to begin with that could open or close, whether it could open or close was entirely determined by the probabilities and the state of the system. But it's kind of a, a simple system, right? Because it, there's only two things that can happen and there's only one thing that can happen uh, when the particle is, when the channel's in each of the states. Then we did some multiple channels, but again, right, the, the, the dynamics of the, the individual channels are still very, very simple. So I wanted to give you now uh, a, an algorithm, a technique for solving systems where you can have multiple things that, that occur. So just as a quick refresher, this is the Brussellator system. So we have, um, we have different chemical species that are labeled A, B, D, E, X, and Y. And if you think back to week one, the only variables that we really care about are X and Y. And in particular, we're going to assume that D and E are essentially just, we don't care about them. We don't need to keep track of the values. And that A and B are held constant. So there's some sort of pump in the system that, that keeps A and B fixed. We have these four reactions where X is produced by A at a rate K1. Uh, we have some interaction between X and Y that takes a one Y and makes, makes another X. We have some re re reaction between B and X that produces a Y uh, and some waste product D, and then X just decays at some rate K4. And what we're going to do in this example is before these were rates, so we treated uh, X uh, and Y as concentrations and the Ks were rates. Now the Ks are going to be probabilities and our X and Y variable are going to be like the number of molecules, if you like, of, of X and Y. So we're essentially just going to repeat what we did before, but now just account for the fact there's more than one type of event. So let's say that we have Na molecules of A and B molecules of B, and X molecules of X and, and Y molecules of Y. So these are just to keep track of what's going on. Remember, Na and NB are going to be held fixed. And we're going to assume that we, we just start at a zero system. So there's A and there's B sitting around, but there's no X and there's no Y. So we're going to use the same kind of idea as we did in that last example. And by that, I mean, we're only going to simulate events when they actually occur. So what we need to do first is we need to calculate the probability of any event occurring. And we're going to use the fact that this, this propensity is just equal to the sum of all of these things occurring. Okay, so we just add them up. We work out what the propensity of all of these different reactions to occur is. And then we're going to take the sum of that and use that to calculate what our update to our time should be. So let's work out what those actually are. So we've got these four reactions here. We need to convert these into propensities, remembering that K1, K2, K3, and K4 now are probabilities per unit time of things occurring. So here we have a propensity K1 times Na. Remember that the more A's there are, the, the more likely this reaction is to occur. Okay, so we, we describe that just by doing a simple, taking a simple product of these two terms. So remember, in each A molecule has a probability per unit time K1 of, of transitioning to this X molecule. So we just multiply these two, two things together. And this is essentially done under the, the assumption that all of the reactions that occur in the system are independent of one another. This is a key assumption that we're making. This one is a little bit more complicated because we have two X's here. Uh, and we have a, a propensity term that looks like this. Okay, so the NY dependence should be relatively clear. The NX, uh, how do I say? The I NX uh, dependence okay. over here this on the web should be clear. The NY dependence should be relatively clear, the Alex. And so, and so the, the second term we get here is because obviously we need two X's to take part in this reaction. Okay, so if two of them are used, then it means that the number x and x is going to go down by one because of the first x, right? So we need to have two of these. So we can't just put the term nx squared here. So this really is, is trying to capture the fact that 
two x's and not one x is being used here. If there were three x's, this would be nx times nx minus one times nx minus two, and so on and so forth, depending on how many x's go in. Okay, so that's really the only kind of complicated propensity term we have to take into account. The other ones are a lot simpler. So uh, here again, now we have a B and an X that are taking part in this reaction. So we take the product of those two terms and there's a probability per unit time K3. And then finally, the, prob the propensity of this happening is, is just the number of molecules time K4. Okay, so what I've done in this step is I've taken all these reactions, I've looked at all the rates and I've looked at all the molecules that are involved in these different reactions and I just map them onto propensities. And I can interpret these in the same way as before. So these are the propensities per unit time of these reactions occurring. So if I want to get the total propensity of any, any of these things occurring, I just add them up and I'm gonna call that number lambda. So lambda is the, is the propensity per unit time of any of these four reactions occurring. Okay, is everyone happy with that? Okay, okay. so now we've got the propensity and we can, we can essentially use this in the same way uh, as before to work out when the time of our next event is gonna occur in exactly the same way. So we do this minus natural logarithm times some random number divided by lambda. But of course, that just tells us that a reaction has occurred. Right. And then the next obvious question is, well, which one we need to, we need to pick it. So to do that, we, we again appeal to random numbers and we, we get an interval between zero and one and we arrange it like this. Okay, so zero is at the left end, one is at the right end. And we fill it up with the scaled propensities of these reactions occurring. So we take all of the propensities that I, I talked about in, oops, in the last guy, in the last, slide and then we divide them by lambda to normalize them and then we just fill up this bar like so so blue here is the probability of reaction is sorry blue here is is the normalized propensity of reaction one occurring yellow is the normalized propensity of reaction two green the normalized propensity of reaction three and pink the normalized reaction uh normalized probability of reaction four and then what we can do is we can draw another random number. So this is different to the first random number, but it's still another random number between zero and one. And then it will, it will be somewhere on this number line. Okay, so let's, let's say we do it here. And then all we do is we say, okay, if it lands in the yellow region, then we say that the reaction yellow occurs. So reaction number two. So we update our system according to this reaction number two here. And we repeat that. And remember what we said before, that by doing the simulation in this way, we only simulate events, we only simulate the system when events actually occur. So given that we know that that's true, at least one of these things must happen. Well, in fact, not only at least, exactly one of these things must happen. And, and what Gillespie did in, in his paper back, I forget what the exact date was, but a while back now, um, he essentially showed that this algorithm here, where you first pick the time to transition and then you next pick which transition occurs, this exactly simulates the stochastic system. So essentially, in terms of mathematics, you can't really do any better than this. All of the improvements that have been made to the algorithm are really to do with, with computational uh, aspects, so speeding the thing up. So once we've, we've chosen what reaction occurs, we then need to update the number of molecules according to the reaction blueprints. Okay, so if we just go through this very quickly, uh, this is very, very similar to what we did in week one, but now rather than dealing with concentrations, we're dealing with, with actual absolute numbers of molecules. So let's go through that. So in reaction one, we lose one A and we gain one X. So we have to decrement NA by one uh, and increment NX by one. In this reaction here, we effectively net we lose one Y and we gain one X. So NY goes down by one, NX goes up by one. Here we lose one B uh, and one X and gain one Y and one D. Oops. Uh, what happened there? And 
Uh, remember that we don't care about D, so I'm not, I'm not decrementing D, uh, sorry, incrementing D, I'm just, just leaving it there. And then similarly here, we lose uh, one X, so NX goes down by one. And we said right back at the beginning that we're gonna assume that NA and NB are fixed. So we then only get a system that depends on NX and NY. So this then tells us how we should update the state of our system, given that the reactions have occurred. Okay, so now let's go back to MATLAB. Uh, so this morning, I sent you the code here. Uh, I mean, I guess we can get, we have a little bit of time now to go through it. So I might actually do this from scratch. It, will, it shouldn't take more than five minutes or so, or maybe a little bit longer to see how this works. So this really now is, is taking us into the regime where we have multiple different um, reactions that can go on. So again, uh, so hopefully everyone's got MATLAB open. We've got a new uh, worksheet open. So remember this example is different now, so we have to, we can't just copy and paste from what we did before. So let's, let's define some parameters and our parameters now are gonna be two things. There's gonna be the number of molecules in the system. Uh, and there's also gonna be the actual rates, the K1, K2, K3, K4. And I'm gonna be really, really, and I'm gonna set them, those all things to be the same. So we have NA, which is the number of molecules of, of A to be 20. And B, which I think I'll set this to 30 to begin with. Not very good at spelling, apparently. Uh, and then rates, so I've just got K1. I'm just gonna set all of these Ks to be 0 0.1. I know that's not very exciting, but uh, that's not really what I wanna focus on in the example. So here's my parameters. As before, I need to uh, set some, uh, set my initial conditions. So let's have NX equals zero and NY equals zero. Then I need to decide how long I'm going to simulate for. So, uh, sorry, I also set my time to be zero initially. So simulation length, I think I put 500 here, is sufficient for this. Again, what we would normally want to do is to pre-allocate uh, if after the session, you, you want to have a look at that. Have a look at the Brusselator Gillespie file I sent you. That shows you how to do the pre-allocation. Um, if I get time at the end of this example, I will go through and re-edit the code to do that so you can see how it works. And, but the code and the notes have all of the information that you should need to do it. So let's, again, keep a time array. So T array is just going to be T and my state array is gonna be the values. Remember, I wanna keep track of the values of NX and NY. So I'm gonna store them like that. Actually, no, let's, not, let's call it N array, not state array, N array. Because it's not really this, well, it is a state, I suppose, but we're keeping track of the numbers of molecules and I use N for that. Okay, so the system is now parameterized. It's now uh, got some initial conditions. And now we need to start the main loop. So again, we say while t is less than simulation length. So that's our stopping criterion that t gets bigger than simulation length. We want to keep this loop going as long as this happens. And now we want to compute the propensities. And remember, these will need to be updated each time because the, the, the values of nx and ny are necessarily going to change. So let's do reaction one rate, okay, which if we look back in our notes, is just K1 times NA. And all I'm gonna do essentially here is just, just transcribe what was written in the slideshow uh, into code here. And it essentially is just uh, exactly copying. So that's the propensity of reaction two. Reaction three. Yeah, I shouldn't really call these rates, strictly speaking. 
they're still propensities, but don't matter. So that's number three. And then reaction four is K4 times Fx. So those are the propensities of things that can occur. And I'm going to add them all up to get my overall propensity. So lambda equals reaction one rate plus reaction two rate. Oops. Uh, I'm going to use this little ellipsis here in MATLAB, which just allows me to align continuation because otherwise things are going to go off the side of the screen. Reaction three rates plus reaction four rates. So that's the lambda. Uh, oh, I need a plus here. Oops. As before, I'm then going to figure out the timing of my actual event by sampling a random number. So u equals rand. And then time to transition is going to be minus log of u divided by lambda. And coming back to Arun's question, so lambda really now is a propensity and not a dwell time. So now I have to divide by lambda, and not multiply by, by lambda. Of course, if I take the reciprocal of this, I get my expected time to next reaction. Uh, but in this example, it's just easier to use lambda. OK, so that then tells us what, what the update time is. Now, of course, we actually need to do the reaction. So we need to figure out where it goes. So let's pick up some thresholds. Now we're trying to emulate this process here, where we set up some boundaries, and then we can define which reaction is actually going to occur. So I'm going to call these thresholds. And the thresholds are just going to be, so the first one is going to be at reaction one rate. So that will be this threshold here. This threshold here is the sum of these two numbers, right? Because I've got to go out to the, the edge of the blue and then out to the edge of the yellow. So I'm going to have to add up these two things here. So I'm going to add up reaction one and reaction two. If you're wondering about the scaling by lambda, I'm going to do that at the end because it's a common scaling to all of these things. So for now, I'm just going to add up these two guys here. So that's that one. So my second one is going to be reaction one rate plus reaction two rate. Okay, and then hopefully you can see that the third one is then the sum of all of these three things. One rate plus. In case people are wondering, yes, there is an easier way to, to write all of this, but I thought for transparency and transparency, it would be easiest to do it this way. And we don't need to include the last one because. Um, oh, we sorry, you have a typo. Um, a reaction one plus, not plus, um, underscore. Ah, got it. Cheers, Crazy. Okay, so. These are just setting the rates, and I have to divide this whole thing by lambda to normalize it because I really want this to be on zero to one, not on zero to lambda. Perhaps you need a plus in front of reaction three rate. Uh, you are correct. Okay, so these are my thresholds, and now all I do is I just use these thresholds to define what reaction is going to occur. So I'm going to sell it, I'm going to generate a new random number. So this random number is going to be different to this one. Each time I call random, I'm going to get a new random number. And I'm just going to go through explicitly all of the statements now. So if u is less than the first threshold, then it means reaction one occurs. And in reaction one, we just let nx go to nx plus one. OK, and then we have an else if. So if uh, thresholds. If, if it's bigger than one, but less than threshold two, then reaction two occurs. And I update as indicated. So NY goes down by one, and X goes up by one. Then we have another else if. So if it's less than, if it's bigger than threshold two, but less than 
threshold three, reaction three occurs. Uh, and I do the opposite of what I did before. So NX goes down by one, NY goes up by one. If it's bigger, it has to, by default, be less than uh, threshold, well, there's no threshold four, it has to be less than one. So then I carry out reaction four, which decreases the value of X by one. And those are all of the events that can occur and exactly one of them must occur. Then I just need to update my, uh, my time. So T equals, oh no, I need to update that afterwards. So I'm gonna update my T array. So T array, and I'm just gonna do, remember I need to store two time points to get the, the nice vertical bars. My N array gets updated with the new values of X and Y. So I need a colon here to tell it that I want to insert these values below where I am now. And I need a comma here. So I want to put NX and NY next to one another, so side by side. So this should grow in a way that, that gets bigger um, as we go down the array. Um, I do need to make sure actually, so I need to add these lines at the end of this loop. I also want to make sure that I store the values of the transition of the ends before I make my transition. So I'm just going to put this up here as well. Okay, so each loop you should have two, uh, you should have two values uh, to update an array. So for me, it's line 35, and for me, it's line 50. Uh, you might have something different if you put more white space in. Then I need to update my time. So T equals T plus T to uh, time to transition. So that will keep clock of my time, uh, keep track of my time. And then I can end the while loop. Finally, let's do some plotting again. So let's plot. Okay, so let's just plot T array, N array. Uh, let's use line width two now, I guess. That's what I put in my original notes. And we should add some labels again. So time on the x-axis, y label uh, is going to be uh, number of molecules. So by default, MATLAB will plot the first in uh, the first column of N array. So this would be number of x in blue, and the second column in this kind of orangey color. And again, I'm just going to add a line that makes the labels a bit bigger, so you can see them. So that should be everything that I need. I'm going to call this workshop for uh, example three. And if I run this, this one might time. Do you have a line width um, typo, Kyle? Uh, yeah, I do, because line width is not a thing. Uh, I might start with a shorter simulation now. Uh, oh, okay, maybe it was a bit big to begin with. Okay, let's try 200. Uh, okay, so you should have something, it won't look exactly like this because uh, this is a stochastic system. But the key thing to note here is that we've entered a, a state where the number of Y molecules shown in orange is pretty low and the number of blue uh, this blue line, which corresponds to the number of X molecules, is, is sort of reasonably high. But the system is in kind of a steady state, a steady state where X, uh, can you show the last video? Oh, yes, I can. Apologies. Can you see that, Fiona? Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so we've, we've entered into a kind of steady state dynamics. So it's, noisy, it's a noisy steady state, but it's one where X is, is high and Y is low. And now, Remember from week one that the Brusselator model had these two things. One where we were in this steady state, uh, where Y was low and X was high, and one which was, was oscillatory. So now let's see if we, can, if we can generate the same kind of oscillatory behavior. And I'm pretty sure that if I just change NB, remember we changed the parameter B in our bifurcation diagram. Let's increase this to 100 and save it. And now if I run it again, 
I might need to run it for a little bit longer than 200 but to see the actual solutions. But uh, let's have a look. Now starting to see how not pre-allocating the arrays really slowed things down. Okay. Okay, so now we can see we get dynamics that look like this. So NB has increased significantly. And remember, NB set the propensity of, of this reaction in which Y is produced. So this the propensity of this goes up. So what we can see here now is that, that Y builds up really quite quickly. X is still pretty low here, but Y builds up. And when Y reaches some sort of critical value, uh, the propensity of this reaction increases because this depends on Y. And then what happens is Y crashes really significantly quickly, builds up over a very, very small time window. So if I just zoom in on this bit here, we should be able to see this. Okay, so you can see this really fast transition where Y is depleted really quickly and X increases really, really, quick, really quickly. And there follows a period where X and Y both change uh, very stochastically, but on a much slower time scale. So X decays, Y builds back up again. When X gets significantly, that means that all of the reactions involving Y are able to take off again. And so Y builds up again. So you get this transition between uh, this slow buildup of Y followed by this rapid decrease in Y and increase in X, followed by another slow period where X decreases and Y builds up. Um, and then this just repeats. Uh, if, you, if you use the, the Bresolator Gillespie uh, code that I sent you, which does do the pre-allocation, you should be able to quite comfortably and quite quickly do much longer time simulations. But the point is that we've changed a parameter in our system and now we're seeing in the stochastic variant of this model, precisely what we saw in the deterministic version of this, the noise-free one, which is that in some, for some parameter values, um, we get steady state behavior. And if we increase the parameter associated with B, so here NB, we put into an oscillatory regime. So that is pretty much it. I uh, just want to end with this a quick summary just to remind everyone of what we've done today. So we've dealt with systems that are we call memoryless, so they're Markovian, so that the future evolution of the system only depends on where we are now. We also assume that the reaction rates are independent, so that uh, you know, we don't have certain reactions that uh, change the rates of other ones. You, there are mathematical ways of, of dealing with this, but they just involve slightly more complicated models. We use the random number generator, this rand function in MATLAB, to help us simulate things. Of course, these are not truly random because uh, computers can't do true, well, maybe quantum computers can, but, but these computers can't do truly random numbers, but it's good enough to do this simulation. And the Gillespie algorithm, which we've used uh, for the channel dynamics and for the Brusselator system, exactly simulates a path of the stochastic model. So it exactly simulates um, the dynamics of one simulation. And it allows us to just make the system at times when events actually occur. And finally, just to link back to what we did at the beginning and what we'd be doing in MatCon, if the system has a large number of elements, so if our N in our Brusselator system or our number of channels gets really, really large, then its behavior is essentially indistinguishable from an ODE-based description. So if you're dealing with systems with small numbers of elements, you probably want to be thinking about using stochastic algorithms. If you're dealing with large, really large numbers of elements, then you, you may as well just stick with the ODE based description because it's an easier way of dealing with things. Um, so with that, I would like to end 